let me take you around the world and after we're going to start in Africa. We're going to start in Egypt and Sudan. And Egypt and Sudan, I don't know if you know it or not, are in Africa. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> and they've always been in Africa. I've been in Egypt, I think, 24 times now, and it's been in Africa every <laughs> single time, with no exceptions. And this is an important piece. Now, a lot of times we start with Egypt or Kemet, which is the ac actual name. I taught a class last night, and a person asked me, Renoko, Dr. Rashidi, should we use the African names whenever possible? A lot of us don't know the African names. So we use both the traditional names, or European names in some cases, as well as the African names as we move along. Remember, this is a process. A lot of us develop a bit of knowledge, develop a bit of consciousness, and then have a tendency to look down on people who were just like we were at one point in time. It's easy to be condescending and self-righteous when you get a little bit of knowledge. But condescension and self-righteousness are not a part of the admonitions of my aunt. So what is consciousness? What does it mean to be conscious? Being conscious is more than the clothes you wear. Yes. Being conscious is, knowing how, what is, is more than knowing the difference between Hotep and Hete Pu. Being conscious is more than having a tradition. It's what you do. I never saw Marcus Garvey with traditional African clothes, and he didn't have a traditional African name. But he loved Africa. So stop talking about you know more than everybody else. Your religion is superior to everybody else. Judge people not on those things. Judge people on their actions, on what they do every day. That is consciousness. Consciousness is not what you wear. Consciousness is not just having a few words of Swahili or Twi. Consciousness is what you do. Now, this piece is right here in your neck of the woods, not far from here. This is at the Oregon Institute of the University of Chicago. You have resources right in your own backyard. I was at the Field Museum today for the first time. I saw the Egyptian collection in the Field Museum. I pledged myself to see every significant Egyptian collection in the world. And that may sound very ambitious, but I've already done 90% of it. Now I'm just kind of cleaning up. So I went to the Field Museum today, and I, I realized that somebody had done some serious work. Because near the Egyptian section, there's a sign that's, and with a map that says, Egypt is in Africa. Somebody put some pressure on folk to do that. Because you know these Europeans don't want to let up. Even now, in 2017, I would imagine the average European scholar, in parentheses, would deny that Egypt was African. So you have resources right here, and I wanted to acknowledge that. Now, now here, it's, it's, you know, you run into politics, too. This is an incense burner that's about 5,400 years old. Okay. It's older than any of us, even me. And this is not from Egypt. It's from Sudan, from a place called Kusto. And this is where the kingdom of Taseti was. The, the name Taseti, T-A-S-E-T-I, -E means the land of the bow, as in bow and arrow. And it's important because this is a kingdom that precedes even Egypt. So Egypt is very ancient, but there were other kingdoms in Africa that came before that. And this is also important because it says that the impetus for Egypt did not come from Europe, did not come from Asia, but came from deep in the heart of Africa. Now, the reason I say the politics come into play is because the way the piece is displayed, you can't see the king on the throne. You can see it in the books where you see the whole image photographed and demonstrated. On the other side of it is a man seated on a throne like this one with a crown on that we are later to associate with ancient Egypt or Kemet itself. So the piece is in the uh, Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, but they don't show you the way it's positioned, the most important part of it. Now isn't that interesting? So the piece is there, but what makes the, makes the piece significant is turned around so that you can't see it or photograph it. So we need to put some pressure there too, because it's not enough just to know you got to do something with it. I want to make you feel good. But the reason I want to make you feel good is because I want you to do something with that good feeling. Just feeling good by itself is not enough. That's the start. Self-esteem. Pride. But what do you do? All right. And then we're going to go right down to dinosaurs. We're going to spend a lot of time with Egypt. So I hope you're ready for that. 
I'm going to go fairly quickly and then I'm going to take you around the world. What I want to do is look at classical civilization. One of the things I learned from perhaps my greatest teacher, a man named Ivan Van Sertum, Ivan used to say, you heard of Ivan Van Sertum? Yes. Can't take for granted now. Everybody doesn't know who some of these folk are. You know about Kevin Durant. You know about LeBron and how many points they scored, the kind of dunk he did last night. But the average African American cannot tell you the name of a single African who lived before slavery. So if you know more about Beyonce, then you know about Queen Ty, something's wrong. We are not being programmed in the right way. So we'll go through Kemet and we'll go through it fairly quickly and we'll take you around the world. This is a very important figure. This is the person that we call the Scorpion King. We have no idea what this man's name was. But the reason he's called that is because there's a scorpion in front of him. This is also, we're going to go through the dynasties. Do you know what a dynasty is? A dynasty is a family of rulers one member of the family coming after the other for an extended period of time, okay. a royal house. Mm -hmm. And you have 30 dynasties in ancient Egypt or Kemet, which means the black city or the black community. And of those 30 dynasties, I'd say 25 or 26 were native African dynasties. You do have a few foreign invaders. You have, for example, dynasties 16 and 17 are made up of the people called the Hiscos, the rulers of foreign lands who invaded Africa. And then towards the end of Kemet, you have the Persian invasions. But of the 30 dynasties, I'd say 25 solid are purely African dynasties. And it's interesting in that the head of every African dynasty was a woman. The line of descent is passed through the female side of the family. In order for the king to be the king, for the king to have legitimacy, you had to marry the female in whom the royal bloodline ran. What does that tell us? That women were very respected in the age. I like that. Now, you can measure, if you want to, the great civilization of Kemet because of the pyramids they built, the architecture in general, the temples, the tombs, the monuments, the literature. But you also look at the greatness of a society based on the values of the people in that society so that women are highly respected. The worst thing you could do was to disrespect your mother. That was considered an abomination. You just didn't do that. It was unthinkable. There were no prisons in ancient Egypt. The concept of prison seems to be purely European. There were no old folks home. It wasn't like you were waiting around to put your parents away. There was no child abandonment there. I've never heard of sexual abuse. There's not a single case of rape in the entire history of Egypt. This is profound, because if you look at Europe, that's the entire history. Warfare, violence, child abandonment, the abuse of women, so that a dog becomes a man's best friend. That's deep. You cannot even find, and I've only seen one exception, and I'll share that with you today, in the history of ancient Greece and Rome, where you have a man and a woman portrayed together. Do you know Plato? who is regarded as the greatest of the Greek philosophers, thought that a romantic relationship between a man and a woman was a form of insanity. If a man fell in love with a woman or a woman fell in love with a man, it was Plato's idea that they must be insane. Plato's idea of the ideal relationship was an older man and a young boy. So don't you go around talking about, I want a platonic relationship. Sometimes sisters tell you that. Look, you know, I don't want to get too deep. I don't want to get intimate. I just want a platonic relationship. And I guess in their attitude, I mean, in their thinking, that's a non-intimate relation. That ain't what that word means. We should examine a lot of the terminology that we use. Because a lot of us are using cast-off terminology that has nothing to do with the African experience. We're using terms that other people have used and attempted to apply to our situation, and it doesn't fit. All right. So here's Scorpion. This is a bad photograph right here. And this represents my work over the last several years in particular. Spending all my money traveling all over the world, breaking up relationships to go and go into these museums and take these pictures. This is from the first dynasty. And this is a brother named Narmer. And this piece is called Narmer's Palette. It's gray slate. It's in the Egyptian. This one is in Oxford. 
in England. This is in Cairo itself. And one of the best things about traveling to Egypt now, uh, I was just there in September, now you could take photographs again in the museums. For about 10 or 15 years, they stopped that. You know, that's very frustrating. They get into one of these places, and you've got this expensive camera, and they tell you to leave it at the door. So about a year ago, in order to make some money, they decided to change, reverse that policy. So you could do a tour to Kemet and just visit the museums alone. Okay. They don't care about the culture. They don't care if you learn anything. They want to make some money. Because the people who are in Egypt today are not the people who built the pyramids. These are invaders yes. themselves. Yes. Yes. And for them, ancient Egypt is a cash cow. They talk about how we can make some money. And trust me, they do not give a damn about you and me. And they treat African Americans much better than they do people on the continent. That's why the situation in Libya is going on. Because the people who are involved in that are invaders of Africa. They will never be Africans. Just because you've been in a place for a long time don't make you native to that place. As Kwame Ture used to say, just because a cat has babies in an oven, you don't call the babies biscuits. You should apply that to the American experience. So y'all going around talking about I'm a black American. I have, hey, questions with that. When did you start being an American, by the way? From the time you were taken from Africa, at what point did you cease to be an African and become something else? So these kinds of questions emerge in these kinds of presentations. Anyway, this is Narmer, and this is a classical image of an African king with a war club, a mace, about to bust the brains out of the enemies of Egypt. And that's what this represents. Many people would say this represents the unification of the southern kingdom, which we call Upper Egypt, and the northern kingdom, which we call Lower Egypt. All right, we're going through the dynasty. Now, this is a nice one. This is in the Petrie Museum in London. One thing Europeans do well in is steal. If they don't do anything else well, theft, they, they, they excel in. Why do you think we're here? But they also took our stuff, and it's in these museums right now. Museums, by their very nature, are, Euro are European institutions. The idea of putting things on display <laughs> denotes a sense of superiority and ownership. And not only are our artifacts on display, but in many cases, Africans themselves have been put on display. And not just Africans. Geronimo was put on display. So there's a whole history in the United States and Europe of human zoos. And even white folks. You might remember a film called Elephant Man. And Elephant Man was a deformed Englishman who was literally put on, this is not African, purely European, because it denotes in their eyes superiority. Now this is Aha Mena. It has been suggested that from this brother we get the expression Aha, which denotes discovery. And it's, it's applicable even now because we are, in a sense, a new uh, era of discovery. We're discovering ourselves. This is limestone. This is a beautiful piece, and it's very well preserved. This is 5,000 years old. Now, this is he's from the first dynasty. Now, we're already in the second dynasty, about 2,900 B.C. That means 2,900 years before the beginning of the Christian era, or almost 5,000 years ago. We're talking a long time now. This is before Greece before Rome, before the first dynasties in China, any of those places, African history was already old. This brother's name is Kaseki, my tradition says he stood about seven feet tall. Uh, he is also the first person in the world to commission a navy. Not the first African, the first human being to commission a navy in Oxford. This is King Joseph. From the third dynasty, this is the beginning of the pyramid age. This is the person under whom Imhotep worked under. So if you don't know but one African, Imhotep is the guy you should know. And we'll get to him Imhotep shortly. This is a beautiful piece actually from his tomb. And this is the tomb. This is called the Step Pyramid. And this is not only the first pyramid, but it's also the world's first large stone building of any type in Africa. This is from the end of the third dynasty. This is a brother named Huni. And this is his pyramid. So you see, the pyramids evolved like everything. They went from basic 
to very complex. This is the first true pyramid builder's name is Sneferu. And there is symbolism here. For example, look at those long, long fingers. Nobody has fingers like that. So the question would be, what did that symbolize? In order to understand ancient Egypt, you must understand African culture. The problem is even the best of our scholars tend to interpret ancient Egypt, ancient African in general, through European lenses. Because Europeans have been the ones who have had the ability, controlling the world for such a long time, to go and do the research. They had access to all of these. Those are the ones who wrote most of the books. We were enslaved and colonized. And so now what we are doing is catching up. And a part of that is interpreting African reality through the work of these European writers, some of whom were honest, most of which were not. This is King Khufu. Khufu is responsible for the Great Pyramid, which is called Khufu on the Horizon. It's probably the most perfect structure in the ancient world. I should have had a picture of it. I don't think I did because, as you can see, I was even working on the presentation when I uh, got here. The Great Pyramid of Khufu, Khufu on the Horizon, is 486 feet high, nearly 500 feet high. That means it's 48 stories high. Hey, I got it. I didn't realize it was there. And that's me, Renoko Rashid, legend in his own mind. This, in a sense, gives you some idea, although it's really, a picture can't really capture it. You got to be there to see it. I've been there a bunch of times. Sometimes if I'm leading a group, I'll go off on my own just to stand there, and I still don't believe it. I don't think there's ever been a time where I haven't pinched myself and said, Renoko, is this a dream, or is this real? Do human beings really do something like this? That black people really do this? It's amazing that we have to come back and remind ourselves that we really did do great things at one time, that we really did have a history before slavery. The stones here, we're talking about 2.3 million blocks of stone. I suppose the average size is about the size of this table, if you can see it. The average weight of the stones are 5,000 pounds each. That's the average weight, which means some of them might be 100, 100, pound, 100 tons. Okay. Now, one of the most two really remarkable things, one is the stone itself came from about 500 miles away. So let's suppose we're going to build something here on the south side, and we have to go to St. Louis to get the building material. Now that's an achievement in and of itself. And then having got the material, you have to put it together. And they didn't glue it together, they didn't use cement. They cut the stones so precisely that they fitted them together like a puzzle. Thousands of years ago, and these were not built by slaves. Let us remind ourselves of that. We know in many cases, even the nicknames of the people built them. Some of these sisters and brothers had, and you know they were sisters and brothers, based on the nicknames. Nicknames like BB and Mimi and DD, you know these are black people that we're talking about. <laughs> and it said when they finished them, they covered them with limestone and polished it until it looked almost like it would glow. And it sat on 13 acres, sits on 13 acres of land. Let's say an acre is equivalent to like a half a block. So let us imagine a dime. <laughs> sitting on 13 acres, nearly 500 feet high. And what that would look like when the sun came out in the morning. No clouds in the sky. This is what their ancestors did. So, you know, if you could do that, we don't have a need to build another pyramid. But there are other needs that we have. So if you believe you did great things, you can do great things. All right. These are just pyramid builders right here. I shouldn't minimize them by saying just pyramid builders, but there's so many. His name is Robert Deff. And even this one is beautiful, even just the fragments. This is in a place called Hildesheim, Germany. I don't know if I saw any black people that whole day I was in Hildesheim. And this is Kafre. He's the second of the great pyramid builders, and he's also responsible for Hora Market, the Great Sphinx. And here he is again. This is beautiful. This is limestone, just in Boston. And this is, hey, look, I can stop right now. This is really what it's about. I love to see. And I cannot apologize for this. I love to see black men and black women together. We need each other. We may be mad at each other. We may call each other all kind of names. We got all kind of baggage, all of us.
but we need each other. There's no getting around it. Now, if we can't even do that, how are you going to talk about black liberation? If black men and black women can't come together, then I mean, hey, it's lost. This is the basic building block. And that doesn't mean to be racist. Racism is not loving yourself. That's called self-preservation. That's called common sense. We should all want to be with somebody who looks like us. If you knew your history, she's not behind him. She's next to him. And you know what? They look proud. And they look happy. And they look content. And they look secure. This is what I call noontime love. This is from the fifth dynasty. This is one of my favorite kings. His name is Sohura. I love it. Dynasty five. This one, I don't know. I may put it in my new book. I'm working on a book called The Black Image in the Ancient World. Now, what am I calling it? Beautiful World and Divine, The Black Image in Antiquity. And it's just images. My publisher is really on me to finish it. Images from the museums. So I don't know if this is going to fit. His name is Nai Usere. And this is from the fifth dynasty. It's not the best photograph, but something about it draws me. Now, this is from the sixth dynasty. Here you have an African queen and a female aspect of God, a.k.a. goddess. This one is important because it's the first image that I know of in the history of Kemet where you see a, a, a pharaoh, a king, painted black. Now, these are black people we're talking about. This is Africa. These are black people that we're talking about. But black is also symbolic. What did it symbolize? In ancient Egypt, black symbolized deification. It symbolized divinity. In other words, black was the color of God. And every now and then you will see a pharaoh, a king, and sometimes a queen mother painted black. That means they were highly significant. This one is 4,000 years old. His name is Nepepet Ra Mentotep II. All right. The same king. And this is one of his wives. Now the king, for political reasons, for diplomatic reasons, might have numerous wives. But there was always the great wife. The great royal wife. And some of these sisters and brothers were really very much in love with each other. I mean, romantic, mad, crazy love. The kind that I guess we all aspire to have in our lives. Now look at that little short crop haircut she's got right there. And this is either her or one of her sisters right here. Now here you see a perfect role reversal. Now this is the way most women in Europe, I'm sorry, in Kemet were portrayed. Not that they were non-African. But the light color represented class. It meant you didn't work in the fields, you didn't work in the sun. You lived in the house, you lived in the palace or in the temple. Look at the afro in this brother. This is 4,000 years old. This is in a museum in Portugal. And this is from the 12th dynasty. Look at the hairstyle now. And you can see what that it was originally painted much darker. On his forehead, it's called a uraeus. This was a symbol of rulership. This is the largest sphinx in the world outside of Africa. The sphinx usually had the body of the lion and the head of the king. It is said that it represents man or humans conquering their lord nature. This is a man named Amenhotep II. This is in the Louvre in Paris. This one I photographed in September in Cairo. This is a bad brother named Sinusra III. He reigned for 38 years. And here is the same king, and I love this piece in spite of the fact that it's badly damaged. This is in the Louvre in Paris. This brother is supposed to have conquered all the way to the Caucasus Mountains and left an army there. Look at this one. Now, this is my favorite king, and his boy, we got folk came out today. You guys must have thought there was something going on here. You came for a lecture? Really? Who says black people aren't interested in their history? We should destroy that myth. And you know what? I think this is the key. That we can tap into this. Everybody wants to be proud of themselves. Everybody wants to feel like they came from something. Somebody, am I wrong? I don't care how wealthy you are or how poor you are. Everybody wants to be able to poke their chest out. 
and lift their head up and say, I'm proud of who I am and where I come from. And this is the, the we talk about black people need to unite. That's the basis of unity. Not just oppression, but history. The sense that we come from something or somebody special. This is Nama Red Menonhead III. This is a bad brother right here. He reigned for 45 years. And he had two pyramids constructed. And his daughter became the pharaoh. And this is a piece that, where it looks like he has locks. This is in Cairo. And there's the same king. I'm going to show you several images of him. Look at those big Barack Obama ears. <laughs> the idea was the bigger the ear, the more you heard. And the more you heard, the more you would know. And the more you knew, the more power you would possess. They said ignorance is evil. Here people run from knowledge. We are told ignorance is bliss, it's happiness. You don't want to know because with knowledge comes responsibility. You might even have to change your lifestyle once you get some information. A few months ago, the doctor, I went to the doctor. He says, look, you, you, you're diabetic. Well, I, what? I knew I had gained weight. I knew my diet was wrong. I knew I was spending too much time in KFC. But when the doctor tells you that, it really, hey. He says, but you need to lose some weight. Says, so I lost 30 pounds. You see, I embrace that. Because with knowledge comes responsibility, otherwise you're going to die. This is at um, Cambridge University. And this is another one of the same king in the Louvre. And look at this one. This is not the greatest piece of art, but look at how African he looks. Now, if I know this, if I can scramble around and go to all these museums, you know these European scholars know it. So we've been lied to. We've been bamboozled. We've been sold a bill of goods. We've been told we didn't do anything when all the evidence to the contrary. Look at that, brother. And we, and here he is again. I love this. So world weary. Look at those bags under his eyes. And that was the image that they wanted to portray. A man on the world. This is in Copenhagen, Denmark. All right, God willing, I'm going to go back next month. Look at this one. Now, this is in Hanover, Germany. I photographed this in September. There's not even a caption to tell us who this is. But look at that happy to be nappy hair. <laughs> look at it. All right, let's talk about the sisters a little bit. This is one of the baddest sisters of all. If I had to say, say rank the top five black women in history, this sister would be in the top two or three. Her name is Amos Nefertari. She was deified during her lifetime. A set of prayers were written for her that were in effect for hundreds of years after her death. And I'm going to show you more of her as we go along. She and her husband are the co-founders of the 18th dynasty. Now the hardest part was trying to figure out which images I wasn't going to include. I have about 150,000 photographs. This is her son. It's not a beautiful piece of art. Even if you disagree with everything I say, what you might do, the art is beautiful. This is a brother named Tutmos the first, and a woman named Queen Amos, and the child that they produce, who is Makare Hepshetsu. Now she's perhaps the most powerful woman in the ancient world. She was actual pharaoh for about 20 years. Now she wasn't supposed to be. Her father was pharaoh, her husband was pharaoh king, but her husband was sickly and died at a young age. Now Egypt had undergone an invasion by a group called the the, the Hiscos, and it lasted for over 100 years. So these Africans say, we ain't never going to let this happen again. And so, normally, her nephew would have been the king, but he was only about 9 or 10 years old. There were several boy kings besides King Tut. So they agreed that she would run things until he was old enough to run to be the king. And once his sister got into power, she said, later for that. I don't care how old he is. In fact, I'm going to come up with a story. And the story is, my father was actually not Tudmos the first. After all, my father was God, I'm an amen, who came down from heaven and impregnated my mother. Who can tell me I'm not fit to rule the country? And that's what she ran with. And she did a pretty good job. And this is from a temple at a place called Deir El Bari. And look at this sister in the middle, this full-figured sister. She is the queen of a place called the Land of Punt. 
And this is in the Horn of Africa, East Africa, and the people of Kemet thought this was God's land. Here's a very tender one. I like the tenderness here. This is Hapshetz's significant other. His name is Sinemut. He is also a great architect. And he's the, the what's called the chancellor. He really ran the financial affairs of the country, but he's also the teacher of Hapshetz's daughter. And look at the tenderness with which he's holding that child. I, I love that. We're talking 3,500 years ago now. And look at the shape of the head. We'll talk more about that in a moment. This is maybe the most powerful pharaoh of them all. His name is Tutmos III. He reigned for 54 years. This is, this is Hapshetz's nephew. Yes, he finally came into power. He ruled all together for 54 years. He's a little guy, short brother with a big head. He reminds me of somebody I know. And he's a warrior king. Tradition says he conquered 105 nations. And he led 17 military campaigns in person. Now you have an idiot in the White House right now, a lunatic. Can you imagine him at the head of an army? But back then, the king actually led the troops into battle. He had to be a pretty tough person to do that. And this is Amun himself. Now, I no longer use words like gods and goddesses because I think that's a European concept. Africans always understood that God was one, but there were different aspects of God. God manifested him or herself in different ways. Strength, fertility, intellect, artistry. These aren't gods and goddesses. These are aspects of God. And this is Amen, who was probably the most powerful aspect. And this is where, obviously, we get the word amen. From Africa. And he's painted black. Ain't that something? Now I would imagine the average Negro minister, if you said this, he'd say it's time for you to find another church home. Because we're just not programmed to think that way. The church used to be, and in some cases still are, very progressive institutions. But in many cases, the churches are at the rear of the struggle. Not at the beginning. This is a man named Amenhotep II, and this is Amenhotep III. This is the father of Akhenaten, the grandfather of Tutankhamun, the father-in-law of Nefertiti, and the husband of Queen Tai. He is called Egypt's dazzling son. He is called Amenhotep the Magnificent. And I'm going to show you several images of him. This is from Berlin. In Cleveland, in London, look at that, look at the hair. Back in Berlin, in Cleveland, and this beautiful one right here is in the British Museum in London. But what good is a king without a queen? And so this is Queen Ty. He selected well. They met when they were teenagers. He was about 17, she was 15, and they fell in love. And you see them together a lot, she, which is interesting because she is not of royal birth. She is what we would call a commoner. But Amenhotep III must have really been strung out. And this is his queen. Look at this sister right here. As a young woman, look at that. This is in Florence, Italy. Look at this. This is about this big. I took a very good photograph, if I do say so myself. And that's the one right there. This is the one that you're not going to see on the History Channel. On the Discovery Channel, Learn Channel, you sure ain't going to see it on BET. <laughs> this image should be burnished in all of our minds. This is what women in ancient Egypt looked like. And she looked serious. Don't play. Don't take no mess. All right. Where's that one? It's in Berlin. And this small enough to fit in your hand. If you like, as we move along, I'll show you one with the top, because it's a long kind of extension on top of her head. It's made of wood, 3,400 years old. Now, how would you do that? How could you carve something that would last for so long and be in such a perfect state, almost like she could talk to you? This couple was so powerful that their imagery and status remained generations after they physically died. Now here you see what's called a stella from a tomb of this man right here. 
and that's Queen Ty, and I'm in Hotel the Third up above. That's what I call eternal love. And I love that concept. These are two of their daughters. These are masterpieces of art. This is the high point of ancient Egyptian art. And I just compare it to these sisters in Ghana right here, these students. These are girls. Now, in a lot of schools in Africa, Ghana in particular, I know Zimbabwe too, I've seen it personally, they make the girls keep the hair cut short until they're about 15 or 16. That way, that's not an issue. I know this is going to shock you, but they go to school to learn. It's not a fashion contest. Nobody wears Air Jordans. Nobody's pants sag. They go to learn. They think, I know this is astonishing, this is one of their sons. And you can compare it to this photograph I took over the summer with this little boy from Namibia. Now here is the one from ancient Kemet. And here's this child in Namibia. And what an attitude this, this young brother has. Look at that look in his eyes. <laughs> These are poor people who have not converted to Christianity, not converted to Islam, Sometimes they walk around stark naked, but you've never seen a people so proud and so dignified. You have to ask their permission to visit them. And then when you do, generally they don't pay any attention to you. I love it. Look at that. This is Akhenaten. Akhenaten is credited with being the first man of nonviolence. And he changed the style of art. Look at these images right here. Look. All right. Thank you very much. Look at these beautiful pieces. Look at this one right here. It looks so lifelike. A sphinx of that brother. And of course, Nefertiti. Not the Nefertiti that you used to sing that makes her look so European. And it may not even be Nefertiti that we're talking about that piece. There's a lot of questions about that piece in Berlin. And look at the, look at those lips. Beautiful lips, just made for kissing. See, I'm a heterosexual male. I don't apologize for that. <laughs> Family portrait. And another one. Look at those big head children. <laughs> Let me show you some more of those. <clears throat> now look. And look at that one. And look at this one. These are not aliens. They thought that was a form of beauty. And apparently they would do that from the time they were young. There's a group in Africa right now called the Mengbetu in Central Africa that still do that today. To me, it's beautiful. These are called the Amarna Princesses. Amarna was the new uh, city that Akhenaten developed. Now, here's one of those girls, and here's another one. I don't know if it's the same girl portrayed twice or two sisters. And then here, these are all from the same period. This is called, in the museum in Berlin, A Stroll in the Garden. And this one of King Tut and his wife. So you see this consistently. Men and women together. Not women subordinate or inferior to the male. All these are too uncommon, but here's one you may not be used to seeing of King Tut. And here's another one. They stand right next to each other in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Now let's see if you can tell the difference. There's one. And then they, they look very similar, but they're different. And this is almost enough to again, painted black because black represented deification. Look at the hair. These are musicians at a banquet. And this is from a tomb. And you see these cones on top of their head. They're made of wax. And there's perfume in the wax. So that when it got hot and you started to sweat like I am, the wax would melt and get in your hair. So you walk around all day with this sweet-smelling perfume in your hair. They like to look good. They like to smell good. They like to party. They like to make love. They like to eat well. They like to live life fully. Look at the hair here. These beautiful, heavy braids and locks. Now, this one I photographed this morning in the Field Museum in Chicago. Tell me that image doesn't have any, huh? Who does that look like? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. 
Tell me that don't look like Michael Jackson. How old is that? This is, it's older than Michael Jackson. This is from the 1890s. This is about 1300 BC, 3,300 years ago. Look at that. Now, I wonder if Michael saw that. Seriously, it's in the, it's in the Field Museum. I wonder if he saw that and said, that's what I want to look at. I'm just, I'm just speculating. I'm not saying that's a fact, but it's something to think about. Well, I wasn't going to talk about the nose, man. Because talk, talk we're going to go down that road, you see? This is, these are the last rulers of the 18th dynasty. It's 430. I wonder if this might be an appropriate time to take a 10 or 15 minute break. I know we said five, but I think this might be good. It's a little crowded. It's a little hot. So let's take a break. Okay. Now this is Seti the first two up here, and this is his son, the person who is to be called Ramses the Great, and he's a little boy. I talked about family and intergenerational transmissions of wisdom. So here you see the father and the son before two priests. Over here is, look at all these symbols. This is an ankh right here. This is called the key of life. I have one around my neck. It symbolizes male and female union. Over here, it doesn't appear to be an ankh, but an actual cross. So sometimes you see both symbols together. Sometimes people say the ankh is the precursor of the cross. I don't think that's true. The cross is a very ancient symbol before Christianity, by the way. All right? There he is as a youngster, Ramses the Great. Look at the scout lock. And again, that same little child with the attitude from Southern Africa. This is just to show that Egypt was African. It wasn't from the Middle East. It wasn't European. It wasn't Asian. It was purely African. These are all of Ramses the Great. This is a bad brother right here. He ranked for 60 years. He had close to 300 children. At least his wives did. He played his part. He signed the world's first peace treaty. But he is also a warrior king. This is in Manchester, England. And this is in Warsaw, Poland. Not a lot of black people in Poland. Look at the hair. The crown that simulates human hair, a human hair that simulates the crown. Where is this? Budapest. These are all the places that I've been to to get these photographs. Budapest, Hungary. Look at this gigantic statue. The picture doesn't do it justice. This is an enormous statue of Ramses the Great at a place called Mit Rahina, that's the Arab name. The European name is Memphis, not Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Egypt. And this is a gigantic outdoor <coughs> museum. And this is a giant statue of Ramses the Great, Usamare Ramses II. This is Ramses the Great in the white, and Nefertari, his great love, in the brown. Again, the colors are symbolic. In this case, just a choice of stone that they chose to use it has nothing to do with ethnicity. But I call this eternal love. And the curator must have thought that same way because these are two different artifacts that are placed together in the museum. This is Nefertari. The root of the word is Nefer, N-E-F-E-R, which means beauty. So if you have a name like Nefertari or Nefertiti or something like that, it means the beautiful one has arisen. The beautiful one is here, something like that. This is in Glasgow, Scotland. This is a coffin lid. How realistic. This is in Warsaw, Poland. And look at the braids there. Look at the details. This is in the Louvre in Paris. This is Ramses III. He was not biologically related to Ramses the Great. But Ramses the Great was so great that a lot of other kings took the name. This is a Cushite. The land of Cush. Now, I know when a lot of people think of Kush today, you're not thinking about a black man from the night. I'm not trying to get in your business or nothing like that. This is an Orioles too. Go see it. Now, I could easily do that, but I don't want to embarrass y'all in here. 
Oh, this sister, you talking about limber? Is she an acrobat or is that African yoga? This is the coffin lid of Ramses III. Now, the coffin lid is at Cambridge. Another one of Amos Nefertari, painted black. Most of them are painted black because she was deified. A little woman, about five feet tall, with thinning hair and buck teeth. They actually found it hair extensions in the tomb. And they loved her. Asar, also known as Osiris, or the Book of Coming Forth by Day and by Night, or the Book of Gates. These are papyrus scrolls beginning from around the 18th to around the 22nd dynasty that talked about concepts like resurrection. These are the first people to talk about resurrection. They believed that you could rise again, but only if you did righteous deeds. From the 22nd and 23rd dynasty, an unidentified king. And look at this sister right here in the Louvre. Her name is Cairo Mama. <coughs> this was the most powerful woman in the world at her time. This is 2,700 years ago. Her name is Amenuris the I. She is the sister of a king named Pianchi or Pie. She is more or less the, the co-ruler of Kemet and Kush. During this time, Kemet and Kush were united into one powerful kingdom or empire. And this is the sister who was the most powerful woman of her time. A brother named Shabaka. This is her brother. This is from the 25th dynasty. And this is the toughest of them all from that period. His name is Taharka. John Henry Clark said, the great John Henry Clark said he gave us the last great walk in the sun. He took armies all the way to Jerusalem. He took an army before he was king, according to tradition, all the way to Spain, from the Nile Valley. And this is in Cop And this is a woman uh, from that same period, the 25th dynasty. This one straddles dynasty 25 and 26. Look at the dark brown paint. What we are looking at, in essence, is like, are like x-rays. A lot of these artifacts were originally painted bright, vivid colors. Look at this one. You do see a certain amount of them with the noses knocked off. Yes, I, I don't think that's the result of foreign invasion. I think that was a religious ritual associated with death. Now, the average sister or brother, if you ask them, well, white people knocked them off. This is a brother named Amasis, and this is uh, in the Capitolini Museum in Rome. And this is, I said, in Heru, Isis and Horus. Tell sister right here, this sister was a magician. She could fly. She could grow wings and fly like a bird. She invented the wedding ring, according to tradition. She is responsible for the concept of domesticity. She is the significant other of Asar or Osiris. And this may be the first clear example that we know of, of the virgin mother and child. All right. Now, who is that? Imhotep. You know anybody else you should know him. Why am I showing him now? Although he lived in the third dynasty. Because in the 26th and 27th dynasty, he was elevated to the status of a deity. Now that's pretty deep. 2,000 years after his death, he was elevated to the status of a deity, in this case, the god of writing. He is the world's first scientist. He is the world's first known multi-genius, before Michelangelo, before Leonardo da Vinci, before Einstein, before Isaac, before any of these guys. A brother reigns supreme, the father of medicine, the world's first architect, etc., etc., etc. He was so powerful during this period of time when the Africans had libation ceremonies. Libations is when you take a drink. It could be gin, it could be snaps, it could be water, it could be any of a number of things. And you pour it in the ground and call on the ancestors. During this time, other African writers, before they would write something, had a, their own libation ceremony. They would pour ink in the ground and ask themselves rhetorically, could there ever be another like Imhotep? That's pretty lofty praise. 2,000 years after this is from the 30th dynasty, the last native dynasty. This is either Nectinabel the first or Nectinabel the second. We don't know which. And he is the last native ruler of Kemet. And then you go into what's called the Ptolemaic dynasty, which is established by the Greeks, the Macedonians, the Yugoslavians, we could say. Now, this is not an African. This is not a black man. But the, the influence of Africa was so strong that he must portray himself as an African to have legitimacy. Just the opposite of what we do today. Why must you be like to be considered beautiful? Why must you put on somebody else's hair to think you look good? 
And in Africa, it's taken to another extent. People are bleaching. They say, I don't want to look white. I just want to look nice. What is it about lightness? Whiteness. That appeals to us so much. You know why? Because Jesus is white. God is white in most of our minds. That's the ultimate form of colonization. The color of God. Which you attempt to imitate. And the sisters say, I don't necessarily want to wear that weave. But that's what I got to do to be successful. That's what I got to do to have a man. That's deep. And then we pass that down from generation to generation. No wonder we do crazy stuff. We are crazy That's right. because the environment is crazy. Yes. It's stressful. The biggest killer of black people is stress. Yes. It's on us all the time. I feel it when I leave the United States and when I come back. When I come back to the United States, my antenna go up automatically. I love black people more than black people hate themselves. That's deep. To love our people more than they hate themselves. Because the average African ain't talking about black liberation. You must think you are crazy sometimes and you're right. To want to liberate a people who see no need for liberation. Anyway, that's Cleopatra and her son. Now, let's leave Egypt. This is from Kush. This is from Kerma. This is from Sudan. I saw this, took this picture a few months last summer. And these are some of the great kings of ancient Kush. One of the Kushite kings. And another, this is a Spelta. Look at these two powerful Kushite kings. This is in front of the National Archaeological Museum in Khartoum, Sudan. Look at this Kushite prince. This is in Worcester, Massachusetts. This is a queen mother called a Kentaka. Her name is Amani Sheketo. She is a queen mother. They were very powerful, as black women should be treated. All right. And this is just Julie from her tomb. Ah, one more piece. This is called the Ishango bone. This is 29, no, about 25,000 years old, 20, 25,000 years old. This is found in Central Africa. This is one of the most ancient counting sticks in the world. There are notches carved on the bone in sequential order. A brilliant a mathematician named Claudia Zawzlowski did a very deep study on this. So long before, when Europeans were still living in caves, Africans had at least rudimentary forms of mathematics. Out of Africa, this is from ancient uh, Iraq, <clears throat> and this is from ancient Iran. Now, there's no, this is in the Louvre. There's nothing about this that says on the caption African, but I looked at that and said, those are black people. Maybe because I was influenced by this card that I got from Africa. You can see the similarity there. This is from ancient Lebanon. This is about 3,000 years old. And this is from Judea. This is from the kingdom of Lachish, captured by the Assyrians in 700 BC. Look at that happy to be nappy hair. Look. Now tell me those are not black people. I dare you to tell me that. Look at it. Our history has been so suppressed. Why? Because we haven't written our history. From ancient Iran and ancient China. This is from the Shang Dynasty in China, a libation vessel of a tiger protecting a little black man at the dawn of Chinese history. Let's spend some time in China. This takes us, this is a bodhisattva, a person who has achieved a Buddha-like state of enlightenment. This is in the Tang Dynasty. And this is in the Tang Dynasty in China. So let's go down, let's start. Shang Dynasty, Tang Dynasty, Tang Dynasty, another one from the Tang Dynasty. Why is the Tang Dynasty important? Because it's a classical era in Chinese literature and art. And then the Yuan Dynasty. This is the dynasty established by Kublai Khan. And then last but not least, the Ming Dynasty. So we can identify clearly, distinctly black images in at least four Chinese dynastic periods. This is not just a black man. This is Bodhidharma or Tao Mo. He is the person credited with inventing or introducing Zen Buddhism. He's the person who supposedly took martial arts from India to the Far East. There he is. That's a Chinese porcelain. That's not an African porcelain. That's from China. It's over 500 years old. Look at him. I could have modeled for that if I took my glasses off and put something on my head. And what about Japan? There are two Japanese proverbs that go for a samurai to be brave, he must have a bit of black blood. Another version of the, of the proverb goes, to make a good samurai, half the blood in one's veins must be black. Nobody has black blood. So we assume that has an ethnic connotation. There's a tradition that the first shogun of Japan was a black man. Now this is Fudo Maya. Fudo Maya is one of the 
patrons of the samurai. He, his name means the immovable. And he's one of the major figures in um, ancient Cambodia. Cambodia. Now look at these. These are from Vietnam. These are a thousand years old. And another one. Not my best picture. That one's pretty good. Now the first two were images of the Buddha from Vietnam. Look at that happy to be nappy here. And this is Vishnu. And this is the Hindu deity Shiva. These are all from Vietnam a thousand years ago. Look. Look. These are in a museum in Da Nang, Vietnam. One of my favorite places to explore right now in terms of the ancient presence of black people in the Far East. Just look at the features. Like Bantu knots. This is from the Divrati period in Thai history. Look. Look at that. And look at this one. And look at that. See, we haven't studied this. The African diaspora didn't start with slavery. Black people began migrations out of Africa thousands of years ago. How about Europe? Look at this image right here called the Venus of Wellendorf. It's the best picture of this I've taken so far. I've been in this museum about three times. Look at that nappy hair. But what about Greece itself? Look at the African warrior at the Battle of Troy in Greek mythology. Speaking of Greek mythology, this is um, Andromeda. According to the Greeks, Andromeda, whom the Andromeda galaxy is named after, the biggest galaxy in the solar system that I'm aware of, Andromeda was a daughter of the king and queen of Ethiopia. The term Ethiopian meant the, meant the land of the burnt-faced people, the land of the black people. She married Perseus. They had a child named Perses that became the basis of the historical country of Persia. Now, how many of us know, how many Trekkies in the room know that the largest galaxy in the solar system, according to the Greeks, was named after an African woman? These are things we need to know. We need to give our children a sense of pride. We are the founders of humanity and civilization. We've got nothing to be ashamed of. This is before slavery. All right. African youth in Rome, Marblehead 2,000 years ago. Look at this one right here in Hanover, Germany. This is from ancient Rome, a Nubian in Rome. This is from Spain, 700 years before the Moors invaded Spain. This is from Asuna, Spain at the beginning of the Christian era. This is a black knight, one of the few images not from a museum. I couldn't help myself. This is St. Maurice. This is from a church in Germany in 1240 AD. He became patron saint of the Holy Roman Germanic Empire. His name is St. Maurice. He is a knight and a saint. And you can go all over Eastern Europe. I've been as far north as Latvia and Estonia in the Baltic states and found these images. This is in Magdeburg, Germany. This is at the end of the European Renaissance. Actually, it's the Italian Renaissance. Look at these men about to be beheaded. But more importantly for us, look at the images on the shields, the heads of Moors. This is about 1350, seven, almost 700 years ago. And then this one, the last one from Europe. This is done about 1485. This is in Berlin in a place called the Gamalda Gallery. Why is this one important in the scheme of things? Because this is just before the advent of the transatlantic slave trade, which would change everything. It changed the power dynamics in the world. It changed, the world, it changed the way the world came to see Africa, and our Africans have come to see themselves. This is the last time when you see clearly an African and a European portrayed on levels of perfect equality. So we are the victims of the slave trade. And that's why we wanted to show you history before the slave trade. Our history didn't start with Chicken George. Now let's finish up with the Americans. This is from Guerrero, Mexico. This is 3,400 years old. This is a little head of an African at Princeton University. But mostly what we know about the ancient African presence in the Americas is from the Olmec civilization. And what stands out the most are these magnificent heads of which we've been able to see 20 or identify. I've seen all of them, photographed all of them. Last time I was in Mexico, which was in August of this year, I was told they had recently found two more heads, but that the, they were small ones, but that the people found it didn't want to tell the government, because if they did, the government would come and get them. This one is called El Rey, the king. 
And here's another. I'm going to show you about eight of them. Look at this one. This is one of the smaller heads. These are 3,000 years old. It's before Columbus, before slavery, before any of that. What are these black people doing in Mexico at that time? They certainly aren't slaves. Some of these heads weigh 100,000 pounds. You would not direct a head of 100,000 pounds to an enslaved person. They must be a, a person, maybe even a deity, but they must have been very significant. Now, you know where we get most of the resistance to this is from Mexican scholars. We're saying, we're not going to let you black people take our history from us. I said, I'm not trying to take your history from you. I'm telling you, there were Africans in your history. There were Africans there. That should build a bond between us. And they ain't happening. And I ain't backing off. Look, I, I take groups to Mexico every year. I encourage you all to at least get one of my cards. So we're driving down the street. I'm supposed to lead the group through the museum, but I haven't been to the museum. We're driving down a busy street. All at once I see a big white building over there. Is that the museum? He said, yeah. I said, stop the bus. This is like a huge street. And he looked at me like, is this guy on drugs? Has he lost his mind? I said, stop the bus now. Let me off. I told the tour guide, I said, look, I'm going to the museum. I'm going to become familiar with the artifacts. And then you bring the group. I came in there, and this was the first thing I saw. And I sat down next to that head and just stared at it for a while. That old man can't seem to say, Renoko, give that guy the middle finger. Anybody who looks at this and says, I'm not African, there's no evidence you could ever give them yes. that would make it. Because some people close their minds like you close a window or a door for fear that a new idea might come in. And I fell in love with that head. This is 20 tons. Look, this is the last one I found, the last of the Olmec heads that I was able to identify. No two of them look alike. This is one of the Levente heads. Look. And look at that one. And this was the first one that was excavated, even the people who found it. It was first identified in 1868 or 1869. The person found it said it looked like an Ethiopian. Then it was excavated in 1938-39. The people identified it, I dug it up, said they nicknamed it Joe Lewis. <laughs> this was the first one that was excavated. And this is the companion to it. This is the one with the braids in the back. Look. Somebody imagined that? You dreamed that up as just a style of art? This is what we need to tell our children. But it's not taught in the schools here. And it's not taught in the schools of Mexico, although it's right there. So I keep saying again and again and again, it's our job. We have to do this. This is called El Negro, the black. That's what the, pe the peasants who dug it up called it, the black. All right. This is from the Mistech civilization. This is at the uh, Fine Arts Museum in Houston, Texas. Look at those, look at the hair. Look at the beard. It's just a little ceramic head in a museum in Mexico City. Look at this one. 1,500 years old. It looks like he has a pair of glasses. And the keloids. This is in ancient Mexico. Look at that one. And look at this one. What is that, brain surgery, trepanation? But it's clearly African. And it's 1,500 years old. And it's in Mexico. <clears throat> Look at this. Ah, the images are so powerful. It is true that seeing is believing. And a picture's worth a thousand words. And finally, look at this one. And look at that one. Black skinned warriors. Look. Black. And another one. These are people of high rank. This is over a thousand years ago. From this is Mayan. This is in the national was in the National Museum in Belize. And finally, from Peru, from the civilization called the Moche or Mochica that comes before the Inca. Sisters and brothers, we are a great and mighty people. We have a history that's second to none, and we need to know this. 
History is our immune system. It tells us who we are. John Henry Clark, one of my great teachers, used to say that the relationship between the people in their history is exactly the same as a relationship between a mother and her child. Our mother is calling us. Our mother is saying, time to reconstruct us, to resurrect us. And this is the basis of the future, to go back and lay that foundation so that we have a sense of confidence, so that we can believe in each other again, <clears throat> trust each other again, love each other again, because in essence, that's really what it's all about. Am I right or wrong? Right. So, I could show you about 140,000 more photographs, <laughs> but I think that we've been very, very productive. Okay? I hope I've given you something to take with you. And then the question becomes, what now? What next? Where do we go? What do we do? How do we take our knowledge of self and translate it into something concrete? Thought without practice is empty, and action without thought is blind. Marcus Garvey said it best. I got some Garveyites in the room. Up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. But in order to stand up, you've got to have a foundation. You can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the fruits of the tree. So that's my message to you today. <laughs>